Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Peter Cosmatatos, Chief Executive of Crafty Europe, the trade body for real estate finance uh, markets and lenders. This is the second uh, in a series of two uh, webinars that we planned jointly with Melanie and the BPF. Um, the first one was almost exactly a week ago, and um, I found it uh, more or less in equal measure insightful and interesting and uh, depressing. Um, and it was Melanie talking to government officials about um, their broadly speaking, their exit plan from the moratorium. So, you know, what what, their, what the revised um, code of practice for landlords and tenants in the commercial property world and the, um, uh, the scheme that they're introducing um, to deal with uh, relevant uh, rent and service charge arrears accrued over the period of the pandemic. Um, this session is um, kind of panning out a little bit and taking looking at both the regulatory aspects and the just commercial and economic aspects of what we're seeing in the market, landlord and tenant uh, relations, and also very much with an eye to um, what might change in the legislative framework for landlord and tenant relations in the light of the fact that we know the government is planning to conduct a review of landlord and tenant um, law, um, although that's kind of been pushed back uh, a, a few times really over the last uh, 18 months or so um, because of the pandemic. The running order today, we're going to have um, a bit of a, a, an introductory scene setting um, uh, session from uh, Melanie. And then I'm going to ask after that, um, each of our three speakers, um, Andrew, Michael and Sharon, who have different positions in the market, to introduce themselves, their business, their experience over the last um, 18 months or so, and then we'll kind of go on into a bit of a broader discussion about both the commercial and regulatory aspects, uh, policy aspects of what's uh, what's going on in the world of commercial property. Do please use the uh, chat or Q&A function uh, to ask questions. For those who missed last week's session, uh, it, it, it's available on both the BPF and Crefsi platforms um, on demand, so you can catch up on it later, as indeed this one will be. Um, so Melanie, I'll hand over to you uh, first. Thank you very much, Peter, and good morning, everyone. Uh, just on that last point, the uh, recording of last week's uh, webinar will only be available for a few more days um, because officials, I think, asked us only to keep it live for a fortnight because they're concerned about some things becoming out of date. So uh, don't miss your chance to catch that one, although this one will be available for, for much longer. Uh, and the second thing to say is a big thank you to Peter for chairing this morning, and it's been great to collaborate with Cressy on these two webinars. So maybe it's something you'll see more of in the future. Um, but my job is to just set the scene for the uh, panel. So I'm just going to remind you briefly what the government did announce, uh, talk a little bit about what landlords and occupiers might want from a review of landlord tenant legislation, and then what we know about timings. So the review was first announced in December uh, last year. The government said it would undertake uh, a review of the outdated commercial landlord and tenant legislation to address concerns that the current framework doesn't meet current economic conditions. They said the review would consider how to enable better collaboration between commercial landlords and tenants, and also how to improve the leasing process to ensure our high streets and town centres thrive as we recover from the pandemic and beyond. They said it would look at a broad range of issues, including the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954 Part 2, and a range of commercial issues such as leases, rents, dilapidations and maintenance and licensing. The minister also said it would include the impact of coronavirus on the market. Officials have told us that the review is not a response to the tension seen between owners and occupiers in the last few months, but it will inevitably consider the stresses highlighted by the pandemic. In our view, talking to our members, COVID's had a mixed impact on the relationships between owners and occupiers. On the one hand, there have been a series of high profile disputes over occupation costs, leading to a breakdown in trust between some parties. And in a very small minority of cases, we still have to agree terms on how to deal with the rent arrears accrued in those cases. On the other hand, where parties have understood that there's a need for compromise, we've seen more transparency, openness and dialogue than arguably ever before, supporting an acceleration of the trend towards the more flexible short term leasing that was seen in several areas of commercial property before the pandemic and has renewed interest in alternative rental models. And I'm sure we're going to talk more about that this morning. Ultimately, the government wants a regulatory system that's fit for purpose and that people actually use rather than mostly opt out of. They're also keen on maximising flexibility and efficiency of space usage, for instance, making it easy for multiple businesses to share a single space 
They also want any new rules to promote a constructive approach to owner-occupy relationships in the interest of supporting the success of places and the transition to net zero, which the government understands will require aligning incentives between owners and occupiers. So what then might we as uh, owners and investors in real estate want, want from the review? Well, we welcomed the announcement of the review. We've been pressing for it for some time. And some of the questions for consideration we think it should include uh, are, firstly, can the law be more efficient and streamlined, there, thereby removing transaction costs for parties? This has been historically our key area of focus, and we've got a large level of, uh, amount of agreement with occupier groups around this. Previously, the government's shown little appetite for more fundamental change. So that's what we focused on initially. And issues include what are the main administrative inefficiencies of the current framework? Are there ways of simplifying the grant of permissions from owners to occupiers? And how do we make sure that any new framework considered results in streamlined administration for affected stakeholders? So secondly, how can the legislative framework support cooperative, resilient relationships between owners and occupiers? And this should include issues such as how the security of tenure afforded tenants within the Act impacts upon the willingness of parties to agree to turnover or other KPI based leasing models or shorter leases. How the halo effect whereby online sales are driven by a physical presence can and should feature within the owner occupier relationship, and whether the law is supportive of this. Whether greater sharing of information between parties should be encouraged and how this is achieved. And if the law is a barrier to effective lease negotiations, particularly in a fast moving market. Thirdly, can the law do more to allow parties to better cultivate place? This could include issues such as whether the law currently allows parties to either redevelop or maintain premises effectively, and what barriers, such as statutory compensation, the current rules place in the way of this. Can more be done to overcome issues of communication between parties that prevent a joined up approach to placemaking, such as the fragmented ownership of the high street? And whether the law allows for effective change of use, for instance, between daytime and nighttime occupiers. Fourthly, does the law support more flexible use, including the sharing of space? Greater sharing of space between occupiers could benefit several stakeholders by reducing costs, increasing the economic use and potential rent for owners, and increasing the vibrancy of places. It would be especially useful for the review to consider whether licenses are working effectively, and if they are as a, an attractive tool for parties as they could be. There also needs to be consideration of whether the law allows for effective change of use, such as that between daytime and nighttime occupiers. Fourthly, can the law more effectively encourage parties to deliver green and more energy efficient buildings? The government's got clear ambitions for the UK to reach net zero carbon emissions within the next 30 years. And both the built environment and those occupying commercial premises have a critical role to play in ensuring that happens. With this in mind, the review should consider whether the law underpinning owner occupier relationships encourages sufficient cooperation on matters relating to sustainability, and if green leases are an effective means of achieving sustainability aspirations, and if so, whether the legal framework is as supportive as it can be. Lastly, we want the review to consider what impact the insolvency regime has on owner-occupier relationships. Although insolvency law is a separate area of law, it's recently, most notably in the form of landlord CVA, has been extensively used to permanently alter important features of property contracts, such as rent levels, the basis for calculating rent, and the abilities of owners and occupiers to terminate a contract. So we think the review should consider the impact of landlord CVAs on property owners and the consequent impact on places in which they're invested and the legal basis on which insolvency law can fairly be used to amend property contracts. Just a word on what occupiers might want from the review. They've also welcomed it, although we think that some of their areas of interest and focus will unsurprisingly be a bit different. And we expect occupiers will be pushing the government to consider whether commercial property contracts should be more closely regulated, as is the case with residential contracts. This could include greater standardization of contracts or the introduction of statutory break rights. We think they'll be pressing for the abolition of upward only rent reviews, whether service charges are fair and transparent enough, and whether the remedies available to property owners in cases of non-payment of rent are fair and proportionate, and whether they can be simplified. So finally then on next steps, we're expecting the review to begin in the new year. We know that the government's been recruiting someone to lead the review, and we've been put on notice to look out for one or more round tables to kickstart the process. The review will take some time, I think, 
and ultimately it's very likely there'll be new primary legislation flowing from it. So in the meantime, as I'm sure we're now going to hear about as I hand back to Peter, the market is as ever revolving without waiting for the law to catch up. Thank you, Melanie. Um, I mean, just two thoughts from me. The first is, and you mentioned it at the beginning, especially about the relationship between the pandemic and what we've experienced over the last kind of year or two, and the review. In a way, I, I worry about the pandemic casting too much of a shadow over a review that is supposed to be quite a sort of, you know, a rare event to take stock of a legal environment and regulatory framework that's been in place for decades. You know, that needs to be seen in a way that takes a step back from the kind of immediate pressures of a short term reality. So that's one kind of area of you know potential concern. The other, and again, you kind of hinted at this. So you talked about how landlords would like to see CBAs and that regime included as part of the review. Frankly, I don't see how you could possibly conduct a review of landlord and tenant law and ignore um, such an important instrument um, and, and such an important part of the, the legal framework that can shape how landlord and tenant relations uh, work and that has been used um, to, to do that. And, and kind of similarly, you know, you talked a little bit about um, the decarbonisation agenda and information sharing and how landlords and tenants can be encouraged to, to collaborate. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I remember probably 12 years ago or something when I used to work at the BPF, I remember writing a paper called Fiscal Incentives for Greening, which looked at some taxes and the way that they did or didn't create the right incentive framework for landlords and tenants to work together to retrofit um, buildings. And spoiler alert, the conclusion was that generally speaking, the tax regime, even taxes nominally designed to encourage retrofitting, didn't do that very effectively um, and created a kind of mismatched incentive structure compared to the policy goals um, that government had. And so again, I wonder how able the team at uh, the housing ministry um, I don't know what to call anymore, Deluc or whatever it is, and, and Bayes, I don't know how well they're going to be able to integrate um, sort of other bits of the legal framework, whether it's tax, whether it's insolvency, that actually have quite an important bearing on the effectiveness with which landlord and tenant um, relationships work. Just on that piece, uh, I mean, mm. I guess it's up to us to make it easy for them. Uh, I mean, we know government is incredibly siloed, um, so it's not going to come naturally to them to look at some of those wider issues. So, you know, I think it's up to us to make it easy uh, for them to join dots um, and to give them solutions and um, specific measures that will enable them to do that. Because I don't think it's reasonable, actually, as an ex-public servant, <laughs> uh, you know, to expect them to do all of that and join all of those dots because they, you know, other departments who with an interest won't won't have this on their agenda. They won't have this as a priority. So I think it's up to us. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. <laughs> so um, thank you. That was really useful um, to set the scene. Um, now I'm going to ask Andrew to speak first, if that's okay. Then I'm going to go to Michael, and then I'm going to go to Sharon. And the, the sort of logic of that is that the kind of um, property consultancy perspective, which is kind of broad, then an, a property investor perspective and then a lender perspective um, and Andrew and then each of the others if you could first introduce yourself introduce your your business and your perspective on the market and then talk a little bit about how the last 18 months or so how you've experienced those and and to the extent that you're able to kind of draw connections with some of what we've already talked about um, that would be great um, but then we'll, we'll dig deeper into a few areas that, that I've that, that I've sketched out in my mind already uh, after that so Andrew Thank you, Peter. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew Hockey, a partner in the advisory department at uh, Montague Evans. Um, we're a planning and development led consultancy business celebrating our 100th birthday this year. So I think we've seen plenty of um, change during that, that, uh, that period. Um, we act for both private and public sectors and across um, all asset types and both for landlord and, and occupiers. So we, we see the full uh, spectrum of this, this discussion. Uh, my particular specialism is in um, asset management and, and regeneration, and particularly the complex um, regeneration that we're seeing uh, so much across the country at the moment. And, and that 
needs to happen. Some of the legislative framework that uh, Melanie has touched on uh, can make that more cumbersome and more difficult to deliver. But the rate of change that's happening across our towns and cities is such that, you know, we need to try and simplify and make it as, as simple as possible, I think. Um, you know, I think for me, the, um, the landlord and occupier relationship is probably at its most strained uh, that I've experienced in, in my career of, you know, approaching 30 years now um, in the industry. And I, I don't think that is, is solely to do with the, the pandemic. And I, I think, Peter, your point about the pandemic casting a shadow over this legislative review, I think, is, is very valid. I, I think the, um, the legislation needs to be updated regardless of the pandemic. And that, that's a once in a lifetime, hopefully a once in a lifetime event that we shouldn't um, allow to, to cloud our judgment around the, um, the legislation. I think I touched on a second ago the, the rate of change, um, and, and that's because of the, the behavioural aspects. You know, Gen Gen Z and now Gen Alpha, they, they behave differently to the way we behaved, and and they shop differently. They uh, they use transport differently. They date differently. They use apps. You know, it's it's the world is a different place, and and we have to adapt our, our um, built environment to accommodate those those changing trends. And I think that was, you know, retail was, uh, retail and leisure were, were changing quite dramatically pre-pandemic, and and the pandemic has only accelerated that. But you know, the ability to to shop at ten o'clock at night on on your laptop or iPad and have it delivered by eight o'clock the following morning. You know, has has changed uh, how how town centres function and, and the uses of town centres. And I think, you know, that that's our responsibility collectively to, to have the legislative framework um, around that. Um, for me, one one of the biggest um, uh, issues with uh, the the market at the moment is it it doesn't seem that we're in balance. There doesn't seem to be equilibrium between the the occupier perspective and and the landlord perspective. Um, and I think fundamentally that's probably down to supply and demand. I think there's there are frankly too many shops in the world at the moment. You know, we don't need as many shops. And I think um, we've got to start demolishing and repurposing and and you know re rethinking our town centers quite um, quite dramatically. Um, one of the, the the points that I know Michael and, and Sharon will probably both pick up on is is the um what we're seeing is the shorter uh term cash flow that, that all landlords and investors are seeing. Occupiers, if they can, will, will go for a shorter lease, but ideally within the, they want it protected um, within the, the Landlord and Tenant Act. So they're, they're getting the flexibility of being able to walk away in three or five years time, but equally they could be there in 25 years time because they are protected um, by the, uh, the L&T Act. And, and that's, that's quite a one-sided relationship in, in my view. Um, and, and there are other changes that I know we'll talk about further in the discussion in terms of turnover, um, uh, turnover arrangements, total occupancy cost deals. I think things are changing, and at the moment, it's changing through the, the strength of the negotiating position between the occupier and the landlord, as opposed to a, a more balanced um, legislative approach, in, in, in my view. Um, so I think with that, Peter, I'll, I'll hand back to you, um, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, you were the first person to alert me to the existence of Gen Alpha. I had not heard of that before. And I'm alarmed because if we're going to start following Greek uh, alphabet uh, designations for generations of people, and we're already doing that for generations of COVID variants, things could get really sticky. Um, Michael, can I come to you next? Sure. Uh, so... Michael Kovacs, co-founder of Castleforge. We're a European uh, value-add private equity fund headquartered here in London. Uh, so in addition to investing in traditional asset classes like offices in central London, for example, we also have a flexible office business that we own and we started called Clockwise, which was started back in 2017. Clockwise is um, mostly actually a, a regional owner um, operator of flexible office space around the UK. And, you know, we've recently moved into continental Europe. It's a bit unique, even in the flexible sector in that we lease space on a monthly basis only. 
So virtually the entirety of our tenant base could leave at the drop of a hat. Uh, so the last 18 months has been quite an experience for us, both for obviously our traditional investments, um, but also with Clockwise specifically, which maybe I'll speak more about and I think is, is quite relevant here. Clearly an office, a flexible office model during the, the pandemic isn't really what one would have wanted to have going into things. I think, but in reality, we managed to keep a lot of our tenants uh, and, and those who couldn't afford to be in our building or didn't want to be in our building or had no use to be in our building uh, left. So there's no lease tying them in. They're free to leave at a month's notice. They're not subject to the um, 54 Act, they're, they're, they're licensees. Consequently, we didn't spend the last 18 months chasing down uh, tenants who didn't pay rent. Uh, we spent it focusing on providing the best customer service for the ones that were there. Um, we were pretty lowly leveraged uh, across our portfolio of, of those assets. And so we were able to you know, work with our lenders. In some cases, we didn't even have any lenders. Uh, so, so we were we were able to make it through on the other side. But now that people are moving back into the office, you know, we're back to where we were pre-pandemic um, uh, in the flexible office sector in terms of occupancy and rate. You know, we've really seen a surge back in the last six months, um, but just with a different rent rent paying tenant base. So they're not even the same tenants necessarily that we went into the pandemic with. Um, the ones that we sort of turned over the portfolio for tenants who do want to be in the space uh, now. You know, and I think that the point of that is, you know, I, I was saying to one of the lenders, I, I'd rather be in a position where for one moment in time, I had, you know, 50% of my tenants left, but they were all 100% rent paying than, you know, 100% of my tenants ostensibly, but but 50% or less of them were actually paying rent. Um, because then we could focus on getting more tenants filling it back up and, and being in a position of strength uh, quickly after. And I think that maybe the, the distinction I would draw then between our flexible experience and our sort of traditional investments experience during the pandemic was that it, it sort of forced us to think about whether or not these long-term leases are something that owners of real estate would want or should owners embrace shorter-term leases. Um, and embrace the operations because like it or not, you're sort of, you're in it. Uh, you're in those operations and those tenants are deciding whether they want to stay or leave just like they should. And so you may want to deal with the shorter term leases and deal with those operations if it means that actually you're more flexible and you're more uh, accommodated to what those tenants need uh, in terms of the lease length. So anyhow, I'm sure we'll get into it, but but that's a little bit of an experience that we had during during the pandemic that I think was a bit unique and interesting. Thank you. And and for me, that that question of the degree to which landlords are close to their tenants, see their tenants as customers, are exposed to some of the operational um, ups and downs faced by their tenants. I, I think that is the central question of our of our age, actually, for real estate. You know, what what is the what is the future in terms of long secure income versus property as a service? Before we come back to that, oh, and actually we've got a question, so I'll look at that in a sec. Um, Sharon, can I ask you to um, do your intro and Thank you. Well, Peter, thank you. Um, yeah, Sharon Quinlan, I um, lead a real estate finance uh, business within HSBC um, and have a fairly significant lending book into the UK real estate market across all asset classes and sectors. Um, and, you know, when I look at our experience, if you like, across our portfolio over the last 18 months, I would say actually it was um, more stable than perhaps I thought it would be um, heading into this pandemic. Um, you know, across the board, I would say generally um, rent collection for my, you know, portfolio, if you like, of uh, landlord borrowers was actually higher significantly significantly higher actually again than I perhaps expected um, in March 2020 when you know the the lockdowns um, took effect and we were all working from home so you know having said that I think that there are definitely or have been definite instances where you know landlord borrowers have um, expressed their frustration during obviously the last 18 months not so much because there were certain tenants who couldn't pay, but actually at those tenants who could pay but chose not to, given the government's stance on moratorium, et cetera. So 
Um, you know, definite instances of that behaviour seen, um, which of course is hugely frustrating um, from a landlord perspective. Um, from a lender's perspective, obviously, I think the big difference in terms of you know, how we have fared, if you like, during this period is a reflection of the fact that debt leverage on a senior debt basis um, clearly is far lower, if you like, or has been far lower during this crisis than perhaps when you look back and, you know, to previous crises, um, you know, 2008 in particular, where, uh, you know, non-receipt of rental income when you've got leverage at 80 plus percent is clearly going to be a more significant problem and challenge um, for any lender than the current situation where generally, you know, average uh, leverage levels are sort of 50 to 60 percent. So, you know, I, I would say that across the portfolio of assets that, that we lend against, we have spent the last 18 months, of course, working with our landlord borrowers to uh, manage, you know, their debt obligations in terms of covenants and waivers of covenants and, um, you know, deferrals of capital um, repayment holidays and such like. But in terms of has there been, you know, wholesale defaults? Absolutely not. Um, and I think, you know, from a, a debt perspective um, at that level, I think, um, you know, the crisis actually has been pretty well managed. In terms of, you know, shorter term, more flexible leases, I mean, if I look back across my career, 25 years in real estate finance, I think there has been a very definite shift towards shorter, more flexible uh, lease arrangements. You know, long gone are the days of a 25 year, you know, FRI upwards only um, lease that, that any lender would, you know, now sort of give their eye teeth, I think, for, for that type of um you know, uh, committed cash flow arrangement. So I think that COVID has probably accelerated that flexibility and, um, you know, that, that demand for shorter term uh, arrangements. But I do think that that is, it was emerging pre-COVID, I would say over the last five, maybe even 10 years, the emergence of that shorter term flexible arrangement in certain asset classes was absolutely emerging um, but I think COVID has absolutely sort of accelerated that quite significantly. So, yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll talk more about it over the next half an hour or yep. so. So, so a couple of kind of just kind of quick fire questions to any of you. Um, I, I, I tend to see the pandemic like you were just describing, Sharon, as having accelerated underlying trends. Does anyone feel that the pandemic has actually done something that changed things has 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 anything does anyone feel that the market has actually changed in some new way as a result of the pandemic is there any change that anyone would point to or is it really a question of accelerating existing trends and if the answer is no no one can think of anything that's changed that's fine we can move on to the next one but i'm just curious if anyone does have a view i'll jump out peter um i i i, I can't think on mm. uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything. Uh, here's a trend that's been here's a trend that has been happening that has just simply accelerated, and this is what Sharon was talking about. We looked at the average tenure of office tenants uh, in in the UK, uh, and this includes it's not just lease length, right? Because because what about renewals and what about breaks and exercises, et cetera? So this is like how long a tenant is expected to stay in that space once they've signed their first lease in that space. And that was something like 15 years uh, back in 2000. Uh, and that's gone to, in 2019 is the last year that we actually had the data for, that's gone to something like seven years. Uh, and I'm sure that if, if, you know, if the data were out now, you'd see it at five, six, seven years, something like that. So that's just, but that's been happening for the last 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, this has really just highlighted uh, all of it and probably accelerated the fact that this is happening. Uh, we've hit that sort of tipping point where everyone's now like, aha, you know, this is, this, this is happening. We're not going back to the days of the 25 year FRI lease. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I, I guess, I don't know, thinking about it, I think it, if there is something that's changed, it is the fact that the, the mandatory full-time working from home experiment has demonstrated to everyone 
that it's not just a question of you know where you work flexibility and all of that stuff but that actually the the assumption of five days in the office is the norm is dead i think you know I, we we all know that that is no longer the obvious default setting and so the question of how can hybrid work properly is is now a real question and i think that is a new question i don't think we had that question before you know just virtual ways of meeting having become a mainstream part of how we how we work i think I, that feels like maybe more of a substantive change but in a way well, I think it is still pay to think that's an acceleration right yeah. because i yeah. think pre covid you, you know large corporate institutions such as banks will have always worked on a flexible basis you know i there would have been lots of people who would have spent some time during a working week working from home so that concept of flexibility was alive I just don't think it was necessarily, again, I think it is an acceleration because, yeah. you know, I think now everybody is is working on a more flexible basis, whereas previously it was probably a far more, smaller percentage yeah. of the population. But now you're right. I think it's it's embedded in our, you know, working lives going forward. And actually as an employer and an occupier of, of um, office space, I think, yeah, we've got to work out how, how we then deal with that and manage that going forwards for sure. Yeah. So, so the next question I had, and, and this might, yeah, sim similar. Can, in most ways, I think, certainly on the landlord side, people would tend to feel that the policy interventions that we saw over the last year and a half, notably the moratoriums, were damaging rather than helpful. Um, does anyone feel that there is something positive that can be said? Is there a way in which government policy in the commercial landlord and tenant environment has been has done something good has encouraged a positive change so i would say i would just uh, very uh, its highest level obviously because i'm talking from a lending perspective but when i talk to my landlord borrowers and what i see and hear from them is that it has absolutely encouraged greater collaboration between landlord and tenant i think those landlords who you know, have, have recognised the challenges of the pandemic um, and are trying to protect their own businesses and find the best course and the best path through the last 18 months, actually, I think, have been those that have properly engaged with their tenant base and, you know, try to find a way through this together that, you know, meets and suits both parties. And I think that is probably a change that for me seems very positive um, in the concept of what was actually quite a challenging decision, I think, um, that the government made to, to, to clearly stop landlords from, uh, you know, pursuing their, their bad debts effectively. Actually, I think, yeah, I think, you're, I think you're right. I mean, Melanie and others have been saying almost throughout that the majority of landlord and tenant relationships have talked to each other and agreed and resolved amicably or at least consensually. Um, and it is a minority of cases that have been problematic and where people have became, you know, behaved in a really stubborn or, or, or unhelpful way. So even though we tend to focus on that, actually we shouldn't forget that this environment has probably encouraged uh, better communication in, in parts of the market. Um, the other, so I've, I've, we've got two questions and, and I want to come to one of them for the more recent one first so we've talked um andrew talked a little bit about kind of retail and, and those that that part of the market um michael's talked quite a bit about office um so james bannister is asking about ancillary businesses bars restaurants cafes um and how how do they cope if large cities like london move to a permanent three days in the office week do they open for three days do they seek rent reductions how does how does that work um any any views on on that? From my perspective, Peter, I think um, I think inevitably rents will drop in relation to, to turnover, and, and it might be that we move more quickly to the, the turnover model, which is, is much more transparent. Um, but I think if we're going to do that, we need to uh, define the FRI equivalent of a turnover lease. You know, I think we we need to wrestle with the difficult problems of click and collect. If, if I order something online and pick it up in a store, how does that landlord 
get some sort of financial recognition for the fact that their physical space is being used. Uh, similarly with returns, you know, if, if I buy something online and take it into a store, then it becomes a negative transaction to that store. So if I'm on a turnover rent, I'm a hundred pounds down by five past nine in the morning, you know? So, so again, that, that, that can't be right. So th- th- these are difficult, complex problems that, that need to be worked through between both landlord and occupier. And I think there's a real role for the, the trade bodies, BPF, um, BRC, British Retail Consorting, um, Revo. You know, I think we need to get landlords and tenants and, and, and hopefully government as well um, around the table and, and thrash some of this, uh, this stuff out. And I, I think you know, the, the final point we, we touched on earlier on about tenants looking for greater flexibility and, and shorter term leases. And I think you know, as, as soon as if there's a, a sandwich shop is only opening three days a week, as soon as they have a renewal event in the next two or three years, the rent will inevitably come down, I think, because their, their model has changed. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think the three-day week, if that is where we go, to, does just raise all kinds of questions for all sexes, I think. So I'm going to move to the, the first question that we had from Dan Mason, actually, because that kind of begins to go into the, it links to what um, Michael was talking about in the Flex Office. So the question is, does the panel consider lessons can be learned from the lease structure of designer outlet villages. So this is a sort of value retail type model, um, I think. Turnover leases, base rent ratchets, but set at affordable levels, outside security of tenure provisions, um, collaborative, hands-on operational management. Um, and, and, and I think the linked question is, and how, do, how does that get underwritten by investors and by lenders if you don't have that income security? It, I'll, can I give it a go? So. I, I think that that is really relevant to uh, the flexible office uh, operation that I was talking about. Look, I think the last 18 months really made us all think about what a lease even is. And I know that sounds silly. You know, we've been doing this for a long time. Of course, we know what a lease is. Um, but I'd argue that landlords really should should think of themselves as pieces of the capital structure of whatever business they're renting to, you know, and potentially highly leveraged. Uh, pieces of the capital structure. So if you've got a 15 year plus lease or whatever it is to somebody like a, a travel lodge or a premier inn or a major retailer, well, that owner, that, that, that tenant that you have, that they're really the equity in the business, right? I mean, if, if things go well, they take the upside. And what do they owe you? They owe you a fixed rent, right? So, so by all intents and purposes, you are a lender. You may think you're the equity because you own the building, but, but you aren't, right? You are effectively participating in their business. Uh, and I think that if you look at the rent that people have been expecting or rents that have been charged, you know, Sharon would probably look at those rental levels relative to, say, the EBITDA of a business and say, I would never lend to those such low coverage levels. Right. I mean, you know, I don't know what these hotels are. So say, say, say somebody like a travel lodge was doing 12,000 a room or something, EBITDA, and they were paying a rent of 9,000 or 10,000. That's what you were able to charge them. Well, well done you. But the problem is when things go bad, they can't afford to pay that. Right. And so I think that if you think of, if, if you, if, if you as a landlord kind of change your mentality and say, okay, I'm a lender, I should be using lender metrics in my underwriting of the ultimate property that that i'm investing into you would find that you you wouldn't be taking on so much risk or you wouldn't be trying you wouldn't be even leasing at those levels or you don't think necessarily that the business would be able to pay that and that gets to kind of what andrew was talking about of, of sort of well, what is the part what is the what is the fri equivalent of the profit participation and so i think that we're all grappling with this right now of okay fine so if we as a landlord are going to be part of this person's business, this tenant's business, well, then let's at least get compensated for it. And, and you know, and value retail does that. Well, listen, I'm, I, it, it naturally creates a situation where I'm invested in that business. I'm going to make this location as, as fantastic as I can. I'm going to invest into it, et cetera, because I'm going to get a percentage of those rents. And so I think that if anything, Peter, this, the, the last 18 months, the experience has probably shifted landlords' views on who we even are relative to our tenants. And I think that'll force us to 
to think about, okay, fine, if, 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 if we accept that and we accept that we're just a leverage piece in this person, how can I then participate in that? And how can I help this tenant make their business as successful as possible and, and, and gain in some of that too? Yeah. So b- before I come to Sharon, um, for the lender perspective, which I, which I will do in a moment, we've got a, a question from Michael on essentially this point, how do equity sponsors underwrite new acquisitions with the increased uncertainty on rent rolls? Are you actively adjusting valuations for this? Do you have a... Yeah, I mean, valuation is really tough on, on, on flexible offices because, well, what do you base it on, right? It's almost like this, um, this, this sort of dark art of, well, you take the traditional lease and then you capitalize and then you take this top slice and then you do, you know, there's no comps, right? If I, if I told you, what, what is a hotel, an operating hotel trade at? Well, I've got plenty of comps, right? I know that it's 6% or something like that. I, I just think you need to kind of look at the risk that you're taking. What are you taking? You know, if you're, if you're leasing as a flexible office operator to tenants who take rents or leases for a month at a time, but end up sometimes staying for two or three, four years, well, you're, you're theoretically not as stable a cash flow stream as a traditional office, but you're definitely more stable than a hotel because people come to a hotel and they necessarily leave. But nobody stays at a hotel for four years, mostly. So, so you, you're not as risky as a hotel because you have a more stable cash. So you must be sitting somewhere in between an office and kind of an operating hotel. But if you go to a valuer and they'll tell you that actually the cap rate that you should be valued at is, is probably higher than an operating hotel. That doesn't make any sense to us. Mm-hmm. And so, I, again, I think everybody's trying to understand, you know, you just, you've got to think about like, what is my risk profile? What, what is my income volatility? And that probably helps you. It, it's probably an unhelpful answer because I don't think that there really is an answer. Um, but, uh, but, but that's, yeah. that's what we'll figure out. And what about the, the lender perspective? So at our conference a couple of weeks ago, we, we spent a bit of time looking at lenders lending to you know, banks and others lending to non-bank lenders. So that was a sort of lender lending to a, to a lender lending to a landlord. And now if we're thinking of the landlord as a, as a lender, um, and, I, and I agree, I think there's a, big, a, lot, there's a lot of truth to that analysis of what landlords do given the fixed return. So they've, they've got downside, they haven't got upside uh, in the traditional model. Um, Sharon, how do you view what you thought was lending to a real estate business, but actually you're lending to a, a sort of lender uh, in, 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 in this environment? It's very similar, actually, because, you know, all, uh, you know, for me, the first rule of lending is understanding that risk reward balance. Right. And, and particularly when you're a senior debt lender, as, as I am within HSBC, you know, we are assessing the risk and getting a flat, effectively a flat reward for that in the context that it's a fixed margin, generally, you know, that that is an assess, you know, based upon the assessment of risk as you understand it on the day you underwrite that loan. Now, to Michael's point, if you have got, you know, a fixed income stream, back to my 20 years ago, you had a, a, a 20 year FRI, you know, your assessment of that contracted cash flow over a long period of time from what you're assuming will be a stable tenant, you know, your assessment of that risk is actually quite simple in many ways, right? But if you're moving to a very variable, operationally intensive cash flow position, you know, your assessment of that risk is very different. And of course, it can be done. I mean, you know, there's there's no suggestion um, that lenders won't be able to underwrite this variable cash flow stream. But I think it does present a different risk profile and therefore should attract a different reward profile. Um, but of course, as a senior debt lender, you know you won't get that equity upside that Michael effectively talked to in terms of his position as a landlord and you know, sort of thinking, well, actually, if I'm assisting this tenant with their operational business, you know, I want some sort of share of the the profitability. As a senior debt lender, I don't see us evolving into that space at all. So our assessment of that operational variable cash flow, you know, will come with probably two changes in terms of 
you know, the assessment and one will be the amount of leverage that you can put against that compared to a very fixed long term income stream and the cost of it to the landlord. Right. Because there's more risk attaching because there's far more variability. Um, And I think those two things would need to be taken into consideration, really. Can I just ask whether there's a view, and possibly this is even for Melanie, actually, rather than just for, for Michael, because it's a broad, it's broader among landlords. What, what it, it, Are landlords open to this notion of moving to more that kind of value retail flex office type model where they accept that they are in the equity, as it were, of their occupier businesses? And so there's a different risk reward model and a different skill set to some degree? Or, or do you think there is a strong desire to fight the rearguard action and hold on to some level of you know actually no we're providing a service for a fixed return and maybe we need to moderate how we're pricing that where we're pitching that in terms of affordability thinking more like a lender but actually that is the right model for this industry or is there a lot of variety in views what, what's the what do you think uh, I think landlords are not a homogeneous group. <laughs> so I think, you know, it'll be very different for very for different kinds of landlords. And you've got all sorts of motivations out there. You've got all sorts of um, commitments that lie behind an investment in property that people have to meet. And I suppose what you'll see over time is that those for whom that's an attractive proposition uh, and a viable proposition in order to meet their own uh, liabilities and obligations, they will gravitate to those investments. And others who are looking for a different kind of uh, risk profile and ret- return security return will gravitate to other kinds of investments. So I, I think there's no one one size fits all answer. What I think is that we will have to uh, make sure as a group uh, or, or as a representative of, of, of what is not a homogeneous group with a wide range of different motivations and views in it, we will have to be open minded to change and to the most innovative thinking that is out there so that we can enable that to happen and continue to drive forward whilst also recognising, you know, that there are assets um, and models in which it will still be appropriate to have a kind of fairly um, traditional uh, approach. If I can just add to that, Peter, I think um, taking Melanie's point that each landlord is different, that their their requirements and characteristics are all very different. But I think um, the landlord community per se will will be quite open to, to this change and move towards something consensual. You know, I think at the moment it's quite attritional. If, if landlords, you know, they if they have a shopping centre, for example, they, they're carrying void service charge and rates on empty shops. Therefore, they're quite keen to get somebody in. They'll they'll you know do a relatively soft deal in terms of short term cash flow potentially with a turnover element. But at the moment, they're not getting the um, the transparency, you know, of of the outlet model. You know, and I think that transparency we need to bring into the industry yeah. to, to help this change. I think the technology exists now for daily turnover sales to be reported and, and you can pay monthly as opposed to this situation where, you know, you maybe wait for a, an annual turnover certificate and, and bill once a year. So I think that all of that needs to catch up as well. But I think, you know, landlords are experiencing change at the moment and it's, it's quite attritional. I think they would be much more... Um, cooperative and consensual to, to be part of a discussion where both occupier and, and landlord sat down and, and just tried to re, represent the model. So on that on that transparency point, um, and it's obviously relevant across a range of different things. So it's just a, a general thing in terms of a specific thing for turnover type uh, arrangements. It links to the um, arrears uh, arbitration scheme where affordability is a big part of the discussion. It links to decarbonisation so this whole question around exchange of information and the willingness of, of tenants to provide more information about their affairs. Um, I'm kind of widening out a little bit, but the question that we've had from the audience is what has the panel's experience been in getting more information from tenants on an ongoing basis on their financial health, be it for underwriting or for turnover leases? Is, uh, are people seeing a greater, a growing willingness from tenants to recognise that that's part of the quid pro quo or, or is that still um, to come, hopefully? Peter, I would say my experience is patchy at the moment. Mm. I think, you know, there are there are some tenants who, you know, have a great relationship with their landlord and are very open in terms of information that they're willing to provide. And then there are clearly those that, 
you know, prefer not to. Um, you know, and if you look to that more flexible underwriting model that, that we're talking about, from my perspective as a lender, you know, the more information and the more granular information that is available around a tenant's operational performance, the better underwritten deal that, that a landlord will ultimately get, yep. right? Because, the, you know, if you have more knowledge and information, you can assess um, a position with, with far greater clarity. So, you know, I would absolutely encourage it as being a requirement um, for the industry if we move or as we moved in, into this more flexible arrangement, for sure. I think in a world where the CDA legislation is being abused as much as it currently is, it's, it's not in the tenant's interest to, to be as transparent because they might be trying to restructure their portfolio and lose some shops or some restaurants or, or whatever. And, and therefore, the um, you know, they're not as willing, I don't think, to, uh, to share that detailed information. So I would agree so that, with that, Andrew, but yeah. surely that's an issue for government, if you like, in terms of a review of that legislation to ensure that... You know that can't be abused. Um, I completely agree, but you know, it's government. I've got quite a long list at the moment, and I don't think <laughs> it doesn't seem that the CVA stuff is is near the top. But you know, I think it should be. I think the landlord and tenant uh, legislation really needs to be as well. You know, I think there's a lot we we've got on our plate. But that that's an interesting point. Just the link between encourage creating the right incentive structure for tenants to be more open with uh financial trading information kind of thing and the way in which the cva regime works uh feels like it needs to be firmly on the on the agenda for um for the review um another i, I just want to pick up one more question that we've had um which i think is probably for um melanie we've, we've talked about the pandemic impacting landlord and tenant relationships positively, uh, and, and we have, um, how do we think that trend will impact the uptake of the new rent arbitration scheme? I mean, clearly last week we had, I think Rachel Campbell said that one of the signs of success for the new scheme is it not being used that much, right? Because, you know, the, the mere prospect of it encourages more people to come to the table because people recognise that we need to move on. Um, is there anything else you'd, you'd, you'd add on that? Uh, I don't think there's a great deal I can really. I mean, where um, there have been positive uh, relationships uh, either already in place or developed, you know, by definition, that's a tranche of the total market that isn't, for whom the arbitration scheme isn't relevant. They don't need it. Um, so the, the arbitration scheme is for people who haven't yet managed to find that positivity um, or are frankly just stuck. I mean, I think, you know, we, we all... Um, tend to sort of think of larger companies but you know out there there are lots of sole traders both on the tenant side and the landlord side you know some of whom aren't even incorporated but you know invested uh, savings or you know pension lump sums into what into one property and so on so you know there, there are cases where there's a huge imbalance between the power of the landlord and the tenant either way there are cases where they've just kind of struggled to find a, a meaningful engagement so um, you're right. I mean, this, I think government's view is that as few cases as possible come forward to arbitration. Um, I think it should be, a, you know, it should should help to deal with some of those imbalances of power where, you know, it, it's not, you know, if you're a, if you're the little guy, it's not in your interests um, necessarily to try and negotiate because you've got, you know, you're overwhelmed by the the power on the other side. Um, so I'm not sure that the arbitration scheme really will sort of turn what haven't been great relationships so far into positive ones. I think it's much more a kind of a, a route through either for dealing with those cases where people have just struggled to engage at all or where, you know, consensual agreement hasn't been possible. And therefore you are effectively having to bring in a referee um, to, to solve the problem. I mean, I have to say for the for the review, the, the main thought I'm having is... Uh, I think the government's orientation is going to be to try and support occupiers, right? I, I, it just feels like their natural instinct will be to make life better for occupiers and to reduce the at least perceived structural power of the landlord class, you know, the rentier class. Um, and it seems to me that to the extent that we're able to identify sensible asks that, that kind of cohere with that view, but that would strengthen the effective operation of the market by 
driving and encouraging better informational transparency, better collaboration, better cooperation. Um, that's probably a kind of winning formula in terms of trying to influence. And if we want, you know, movement on CVAs, for example, if we can link that to, to trying to create the right incentive framework for better informational transparency for from occupiers, um, link all of that to the, the decarbonisation agenda and the, the need for better informational exchange between the parties and collaboration, cooperation between the parties in order to be able to meet broader different government um, goals. Yeah, it, it hope, hopefully that's, um, it, it's less of a tall order than trying to just dig your heels in and say, you know, no, you know, we're not the bad guys here. There are all these, you know, occupy businesses that over leverage with too much property at rents they can't afford. And then they expect us to bail them out when they hit difficult times, even though we don't get the upside in the good times. I don't know. I, it, it's it's an interesting challenge. We're we're running out of time. Um, it's been it's been an interesting discussion. I I don't really have anything uh, further that I want to ask. Does anyone else have any kind of closing thoughts that they'd like to contribute? Any of you um, before we wrap up on any aspect of this? On Michael and on the, Melanie. On, yeah. On on the legislation, the the thing I'd, I'd echo what you just said, Peter, which is that. Rather than sort of trying to dig our heels in, I think if we're talking about things from a landlord's perspective, probably recognizing that this legislation is going to help transition to a period where we all think of ourselves as participants in some of those tenants' businesses. And you know, to, this is this is I think Andrew was making this point of with retail, it's like rents are just going to go down. Of course they are, right? I mean, if you had physical retail having a monopoly for so long and suddenly virtual or online retail comes along and says, hey, I can deliver things to people as well, um, rather than necessarily people just going to the stores, well, then the rents that physical retail is able to charge fall. Uh, on offices, right? If we can have this meeting here instead of in a conference room or in some sort of built environment, well, then the rent that offices or uh, you know workspace uh, is able to charge false because there's now someone competing against that monopoly that you used to have in in the real world and so it's it's not a lot of these sort of cyclical uh, adjustments that that have been ha that have happened right are are sort of maybe more structural in nature and i think landlords probably should just look at the industries that their tenants are in and ask yourself is that person's pricing power increasing or decreasing? Because if it's decreasing, you may be owed rent, but guess what? You, I'm not sure that you're going to necessarily recover that because you're out of the money and you, you probably won't be in the money for some time or if ever, because that person's ability to charge that or pay that rent um, is, is, is maybe permanently impaired. So, so you know, if this kind of forces everybody to have a think about how to... Um, how to be collaborative through to get through this because on the other side it's just going to be more of it um maybe that's the way that we should be as landlords be thinking about it thank you melanie a closing uh comment from you you unmuted a moment ago <laughs> yeah. yeah um just uh, there's a great question came in at the last minute which we didn't have time to answer about trust uh, and I absolutely do think that, you know, trust is not where it should be between landlords and, and tenants. And unless we can address that as part of this conversation and this review, then we're never going to get to uh, the optimal position in terms of the, and the review, the legislation and all of that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to all the speakers, particularly Michael, who's joined us from the US at an ungodly hour. Um, and thank you to the audience who stayed with us uh, and to everyone who watches on demand. Um, interesting discussion and it'll be interesting to review and revisit uh, where we are uh, in a few months time uh, and once we see the launch of the, uh, the, launch of the review. Uh, thanks all very much. Enjoy your day. <laughs>